Okay, buenos dias. Buenos dias, right, we've got to get some energy. This is all about youth, this is about the next generation. So we're really excited to have this be, you know, the last and the best panel. Um, can I just have a show of hands? Let's get some energy back in the room. Who here, along the course of your career, had some form of mentor? Someone that helped you along your career path? Okay, I see most hands are up. Okay, I would ask that all of you put yourselves in the shoes of these rising stars, because this truly is the next generation. These are the future CEOs of our business. And you know, I'm relatively new to the you know, agency business. When I came out of college, I thought that you know, investment banking and finance was the place to be. And I truly believe that media is the new finance. And so how do we actually attract the rising talent? How do we actually see what is going to be the compelling reasons why talent comes into our business? And when you think about it, you know, all of our brands, they want to connect with millennials. You know, millennials being defined as 18 to 34 year olds. Well, why aren't agencies also clamoring over millennials? You know, when you think about it, millennials, obviously the growth engine of this country, about 23% of the US population are millennials, 18 to 34 year olds. And when you think about it, multicultural is millennial. 43% of all millennials are multicultural. 21% Hispanic, 13% African American, and 9% Asian. So how are we really dealing with the new realities of what the millennial or you know, kind of the next generation of talent looks like? A lot of the folks are actually here on this panel. And you know, we talk about transformation at the forays and the idea effect. You know, I think here's an idea that will affect all of us in this room and the industry at large. You know, we haven't seen a lot of transformation at this conference, I'd argue. You know, what have we seen? We've seen a lot of you know, folks that have been competitive on these panels, combative on these panels, and lots of old white men. Mm -hmm. I would argue that real transformation is already happening in our industry, we just have to open our eyes. And the transformation is happening with the folks on this panel. What do we see? We actually see a group of people that are collaborative and connected. They self-organized and they all met for dinners and they kind of went over what their talking points were gonna be, all unprompted by anyone at the forays or their agencies. You know, they are purpose driven. You know, you saw some of the research uh, that we saw this morning, but they really want to be a part of a big idea. You know, they want to make that dent in the universe that Steve Jobs spoke about, and they want to be related to things that are going to be meaningful and cause driven. And they are young, they are diverse, and they are inclusive. So, you know, with that, I'd really like to open up the panel, and maybe I'll just have each and every one of you to say your name, what agency you work at, and what you do at your agency and we want this to be the final time that you mention your agencies because we're going to be taking our agency hats off. This is about the talent and the thought leadership from these folks. So ladies first, can we start with you, Lauren? Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Lauren Johnson. Um, I'm at MediaVest. Um, I'm a con uh, Connections Associate Director on the Walmart team. Um, and my team essentially builds the, the portfolio um, group. So we look at everything across all the different categories and make sure we're going to market with a full um, Walmart strategy as opposed to sometimes the grocery strategy, the electronic strategy, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my group. Great. Thanks. Um, I'm Jessica Merrill. I work at Initiative on the innovations team. Um, and we're tasked with ensuring that our clients are kept um, at the forefront of emerging trends in media and technology. I'm Jenny Hoffman. I work at MEC. And I kind of have a dual role. So I am a senior digital planner on the Marriott account. So we oversee about nine or 10 brands under the Marriott portfolio. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I help out um, on the business development and new business team. So a good way to balance out a few of my interests. And I'm Onisha Tripathi. I'm at the Martin Agency. I have sort of an unofficial dual role as well. I'm a digital planner by trade, um, but also help out with non-media clients with their digital strategy and how to make that message more engaging and reach the right audiences. Hello, I'm Carolina Palomino at MediaVest, MB42 Multicultural. I work on the Post account, I'm the media director, and my role is actually a little dual as well. I oversee both uh, general market and Hispanic uh, multicultural, so kind of working both to bring it all together. Uh, I'm John Konigsberg, I'm media supervisor at Razorfish, where I oversee all the digital allocations for uh, the bank side of, the, of uh, Citibank. Good morning. Uh, I'm Trevor Guthrie. I'm at OMD, uh, and I'm the East Coast Director for Ignition Factory. So Ignition Factory is focused on intelligence, so making sure our clients know what's new and what's next, and then ideas. So we're actually pitching creative media ideas, often laced with technology, uh, to the clients we work with. 
So great. So, you know, we actually met yesterday and it was really interesting to see the disconnect between a lot of the conversations that have been going on on stage, you know, at the forays over the past call it, you know, two and a half days. And there are a lot of things that you guys were really either, you know, keying in on or noticing or observing. And I think one of the key things that you all mentioned was collaboration. And I think it was, um, you know, maybe it was Monisha that actually said, you know, that all great case studies you know, start with uh, saying, well, you know, we got, the client got all the agencies in the room and that's when real collaboration started and that's how we got some really great work together. You know, Jess, maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, what are your thoughts on collaboration? How has that actually impacted you in the work? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's really interesting. You know, we, we kind of did a, yesterday a little bit of a course correct in, in how we are going to speak to all of you um, and hearing what everybody had to say and a lot of the things that we were thinking about were things that were being addressed here. Um, which was good news. Um, and so, you know, one of the things, um, and I believe it was the, the creator of the flying cockroach that um, was also quoted as saying um, that this is, is a growth game, it's not a share game. And I think that's really important um, for the entire industry, but especially for, um, you know, the, the youth of the industry, um, for us sitting up here and, and the, the group of people that we represent. Um, I think that, uh, you know, as Stephen pointed out, that, you know, Monisha had said that, um, that everything that we heard up here that was truly inspiring from a brand's perspective or that a client spoke to um, was in relation to, there were always the, the words, we all got together, we all sat down in a room, and then the idea that they then ex you know, explained to us or told us was this amazing idea that for any one of us is a dr would be a dream to work on. Um, and so I think that it's gonna be really important moving forward to um, from, you know, from the ground up and from the top down to really foster a culture of collaboration in which the you know, seven of us can sit um, at a conference like this and, and listen to what everybody has to say and then share our thoughts and ideas on it and not um, you know, pigeonhole ourselves as I'm at initiative so I can't talk to Jenny at MEC because there's this, competitive, you know, this competitiveness um, and really say like, how would that apply, apply to what I do and how can we maybe bounce ideas off of each other to kind of make sure that, um, that as an industry we, we are you know, working as best we can to make sure that, that we stand out moving forward. You know, and you know, the idea of collaboration is not just, you know, kind of amongst yourselves. You know, it also has to do with the kind of work that's being done. You know, so many folks are in silos. And, you know, when you're working in, you know, Dart all day long, it's very lonely. You're just looking at numbers on a screen and not really able to collaborate. And it doesn't feel very entrepreneurial. You know, John, maybe you could talk a little bit about how do we really inject entrepreneurism into the agency? Because certainly a lot of folks that are kind of your generation really want that entrepreneurism entrepreneurism, they want to do more within the agency. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I was an entrepreneurship major coming out of college. Uh, one of the things that resonated with me the most that I saw this week is we saw a great presentation on Monday that showed that the no for people entering the workforce, the number one aspiration right now is to be an entrepreneur. Um, and I think we should be really excited about that. Um, I think if you want to think about the ideal mindset to think about what we do, I think entrepreneurialism is a really interesting place to start. Uh, you know, we, what we do in the, in the media business, we tap into that desire to create. Uh, we, you know, craft strategies that build businesses. We're at the forefront of disruptive change in, in, in industries and categories. So there, there's a lot of overlap there, and I think there's a huge opportunity to channel that general interest in being an entrepreneur outside our companies into being an entrepreneur inside of them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, w you know, one thing that I try to instill in the people that I work with is um, something that I call Lego leadership. So if you think about a Lego, a Lego is playful, it's creative, it's inspirational, it's experimental. But more than anything else, I think this gets back to collaboration, it takes on its value when it snaps together with the, with the other pieces around it and recombines and sort of becomes something bigger than the sum of its parts. So I think we need to, you know, instill that sense of utility and creativity in the people around us. And when you think about an entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurs are born Lego leaders. Uh, they, you know, they live to do. Um, they're inspired to collaborative action. So I, I think we would benefit greatly from bringing that kind of culture into our companies. And, uh, you know, I think we should, again, be super excited that the people entering the workforce want to be doing something entrepreneurial. And I think we have an opportunity to sort of reframe the value proposition that we offer to, to pull those people in. You know, the, the spirit of entrepreneurship is so powerful amongst, call it, you know, the millennial generation. 
but when you get into the agency role, you're really kind of defined in your little silo. Mm -hmm. And one of the key things that we see is constant demand for new learning and growth and training and development and just exposure to more things. And you know, when I was in investment banking, they have rotation programs, so you actually work in M&A and you work in sales and trading and you work in research, but you have a more diverse experience. You know, one of the things that we really don't see a lot in many agencies is actually having that type of rotation. And one of the key things that we see is if we are truly in a multicultural world, all of the growth that's gonna happen over the next 10 years in this country will be coming from multicultural customers, consumers. Well, how are our agencies prepared for that type of work? And you know, Carolina, you talk a lot about marketing to a multicultural nation. What's the importance now that you're in this kind of total market role? How do you see you know, the ability for folks to kind of rotate through and be exposed to multicultural? I think going back, uh, just the importance of multicultural period. Um, in the last couple of years, it has been there. Uh, a lot of marketers have taken notice of it, but it hasn't been until the last two years, maybe, when the census came out, and we actually saw the numbers. Uh, that multiculturalism was here to stay. It really was no longer a niche market. It was something that it was part of the total market. Uh, so I think one of the greatest things and one of the things that we, we all starting to do but we need to do better is how do we integrate? So it's really not about checking a box and putting it to the side and making sure that you have an African-American plan, that you have an Asian plan, that you have a Hispanic plan. But how do you make sure that it is a multicultural plan? It is a plan led by multicultural insights because the fabric of our nation is multicultural. These are the people that are driving the economy. These are the people that are making the purchase decisions. So how do we make sure that internally uh, we empower people, we bring that passion? I think one of the greatest things that we always see is that a lot of us from a multicultural background have a passion for it. So how do we spread that? So it really doesn't just stay on us. It goes throughout the entire, um, the entire organization. And then even looking up here, um, it's great to see that we are more diverse. If you compare us to the panel, of, the first panel of yesterday, where we know it was a big <laughs> <laughs> agency head. <laughs> It's definitely a big difference, and I think you are seeing at the future. This is the future of our company, and we just got to make sure that we, we really take that message through the entire industry. You know, one of the key things that everyone keeps on talking about is culture. And, you know, there's a lot of lip service that's given the culture, and we know that the industry stats are really abysmal with, you know, I think it's the 40% churn. But when you actually think about it, one part of the equation is actually acquiring the talent. The other part of the equation is really retaining the talent, right? And, you know, Jenny, you know, you actually have spoken a lot about, you know, kind of culture and talent retention and just the idea of communication. I mean, how many folks in this room are actually going to go back to your office and talk to, call it, you know, associate directors and below and communicate what actually happened here at the 4As? How many guys actually, you know, do kind of CEO breakfasts or, you know, just really give exposure to the up and coming talent in your organization? Can you talk a little bit about the communication and transparency? Sure, sure, absolutely. And I think um, first we should talk about garnering new talent, right? So we saw that that was a big issue where entrepreneurs was the number one desired field and advertising was barely above lumberjacks. Um, but I find there's juxtaposition there because I know I have a lot of friends reaching out, a lot of friends of friends sending resumes. And these people, they're eager, they're smart, but most importantly, they aren't jaded yet. I think a lot of people in this room, we've been in advertising for a while and we're jaded. Um, so now that we have those new people in the agency, how do we retain them? How do we keep them there? Um, and at our levels, it's a revolving door. People are in and out every few months, every year. And between the seven of us talking this week, um, we kind of figured out, the secret's out, that all the agencies are basically the same when it comes down to what we're doing. Sorry, I hate to burst the bubble. Um, so so when, we, when we think about that, you know, how, do we, how do we make our agencies different? How do we really invigorate that culture? Um, so what I'm asking you to do, I think we should really start thinking about agencies as cafeterias. Um, it's not just because I'm hungry, but I'll explain. So when you go into a cafeteria, there are lots of options in front of you, right? So you have your tray, you go around, you might pick something up um, that you think looks really good, you try it, and hey, guess what? It is really good, it's great. Um, you might put something on your tray that you, know, you, you didn't think you were gonna like, but you try it and it's delicious. You weren't expecting it, but you really liked it. That's how you need to start thinking about these people on stage. We all want to try different things. And the only way we're going to do that is if you let us. So, so to Stephen's earlier point, I mean, if we're talking about rotations, you've got to let us try it. You've got to let us do new things. Um, and it's really a benefit to the clients as well. I mean, the clients want new minds, new experiences on their account. So I think um, we really need to think about it that way. And when we do this rotation, we will discover our passions. 
and when we discover our passions, we will be inspired. And inspired leaders are leaders that people follow. So that's when you retain the talent, that's when people stay at an agency. I can tell you that I truly believe that my reputation is worth more than $10,000, $20,000 I'll get from jumping ship and moving to a new agency. And I think that's something that we've been talking about and realizing is that your reputation is very important and when you build that up, uh, it's invaluable. So, you know, I always try to tell my team that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So we really need to look at the industry, change the way we're looking at the industry and it'll change. And you've got a lot of smart people up here that, that are willing to do that work and really pull people in. So when you create, <laughs> when you create that, that culture internally, that's what retains the talent and that's what makes people excited to be here. So. You know, that's real transformation. And you know, part of it is actually transforming the perception of this industry. You know, I, I can't think of a more fascinating business to be in. You know, again, the whole idea of you know, media and marketing as the new finance, because it's, it's this true convergence. But there is this perception problem. And I do think there is a lot of jadedness that happens in the industry. But again, the folks here aren't really jaded. And you know what, you guys are inspired by all the cool stuff that we do. You know, Trevor, you know, you, you've spoken a lot about you know, some of the cool things that happen that really can't really you know, take place anywhere else. Can you talk about some of the perception, some of the cool things that you see in our space? Yeah, uh, and just a couple things too. I mean, I think as a media agency, we, or as a media industry, we probably do the worst job of advertising ourselves. Mm -hmm. So when people think about advertising, I think they always break into these two buckets. There's the account guys, um, and then there's the, the Don Draper creative guys. Nobody really understands, like outside of this room, that there's this whole other section of media. And I think right now that we're at kind of the focal point where we're leading the conversation and having the 12 agencies that a lot of the brands we work with come in, and we're kind of that central connecting thread. Um, and we also have a couple other things that come into that. Like we are at the epicenter of digital and at the epicenter of technology, and also we're actually managing the investments for our clients. So there's a, a big role that's sitting at that table. Um, now on, on, the, on the understanding, I think, of, of like what our industry's doing, um, I think uh, like all of us up here are so ingrained in technology, and I think that's gonna be the big focus as we go forward. Um, I know as, as I'm sitting at my agency every day, we're trying to figure out like how do we bring technology into things, and so we're doing other things like building hackathons or having startup incubators. So it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental difference, in, and it's not just media planning, but we're trying to find technology and digital and how do we naturally weave those into the projects that we're working on. You know, it's, it's so funny that you, you really focus on technology. First of all, all of you guys are 100% digital, right? I mean, I used to work in the technology industry for, for about eight years. I worked on, uh, most of it at Akamai Technologies. And, you know, we used to make fun of the, you know, advertising agencies by calling it digital because everything's digital, right? I mean, the whole idea is it's really technology driven. Do you understand IP addresses? Do you understand APIs? Do you understand data feeds? And that really is the future. I mean, I think of all of you guys, you will be best positioned because the future CMOs are gonna be fused of CTOs. But also, you need to understand about business. You know, Lauren, you talk a lot about the whole idea of business planning, business understanding, and how do you actually take things that are applicable from other businesses and categories and industries and applying it to not only the media agency business, but also to your client's business. Can you talk about that? Yeah, and, and I definitely want to go off of what Trevor has said, that we are at a really cool intersection between technology, media, creative, and then of course we cannot lose sight of the business, because at the end of the day we can get caught up in how cool the, the next new shiny object is. But at the end of the day, we've got to understand what our clients are looking for. What, and, and, and to be able to do that, we, we've really got to know what, what is eating the, the CMO up at night? You know, what is keeping them up and, and, and why? Um, so we've got to read the trades. We've got to understand what is happening, not only in the advertising industry, but in the business side. What's happening in Wall Street? Um, and we've got to train our talent to make sure that they are looking for those kinds of things, that they are excited about the business side. Um, a lot of folks that, that I have recruited for uh, my team come out of a, uh, a business major or, you know, of course, John is somebody who came from an entre entrepreneurship major. Um, so we kind of, we need to make sure we're embracing the business side of things because I think it's, it's definitely something that, that the newcomers in, of, of our industry um, would embrace and, and can it get excited about. So we've got to have the training um, that's necessary to keep them motivated um, as well as, um, you know, making sure we know about the actual, um, the client's business and, and, and bringing them uh, into the fold in that way as well. You know, part of understanding the client business is also client management. 
And I would say that one of the key things that a lot of you have you know, kind of spoken about on the panel is how do you not only manage the client, but how also how do you actually manage internally? How do you actually manage up? How do you manage the client leads? How do you manage your you know, other you know, cross-matrix organization to make sure that you're not over-promising so that you guys under-deliver? So that you, know, you have a client lead, maybe someone that runs the Walmart business, that's saying, you know, hey, we could actually do that tomorrow, but that means that you guys are going to be there till midnight you know, slaving away. Um, you know, the whole idea of being able to push back on the client all that client management and internal agency management. Monisha, you know, maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, definitely. And I think so much of that comes from what Lauren is talking about, kind of understanding your brand's business. You know, understanding who your brand is is so much more than the target definition that you put in the setup for a plan deck. That's not all that there is. It's important, definitely, but I think once you start to understand what, how does your brand make money? What are they trying to do? What is their brand prop? All of that stuff, it needs to be filtered down to every single level of the agency partners. And I use the word partners, it's very important, and I do this with my teams too, is we all want to collaborate. We all want to be integrated. So let's look at each other as partners. Let's break down those agency walls and say, you know, I'm the media partner of this project, so-and-so is the creative partner, and we have our brand partner, who our client. Um, and I think once we can do that, then we're gonna have the smartest work that there ever could possibly be. I mean, you know, we've talked about, Stephen just mentioned, some of the best projects that we've seen presented at this conference have come from that collaboration and looking at each other as partners, not competition. And really, we're all at the end goal, but first we have to figure out what that goal is. What is the brand goal? Because it's not always just sales. Um, sometimes it's something completely different. It's a perception issue. And each project needs to be looked at individually that way. So, you know, I'd love to kind of have a toss-up question. I mean, one of the key, or I guess the two really key defining trends that I think are transforming the business are truly solo mo. I mean, everything's already digital, but social, hyper-local, you know, geolocation and mobility are truly transforming the business as well as multicultural. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd love for you guys to talk about how you see some of those trends and how that actually impacts you guys specifically. Like, you know, who here is a cord cutter? You know, are you guys actually consuming TV less versus, you know, using tablets to actually consume media? Um, you know, maybe, Don, you want to take yeah, that? Yeah, uh, so I think in my, in my work life, uh, Solomo is, real. It, it has me giddy. Um, I think, you know, it means more personalized, uh, more, you know, contextually relevant ways to communicate with consumers. It also means, you know, new, really interesting ways to drive them to action. Um, it's bridging the digital and the physical world in ways that we haven't been able to do. We saw uh, during one of the creative presentations earlier this week, we saw the example from Delta of the, gla the glass bottom jet or the glass bottom plane. Um, I think there's new experiences there that as marketers, it's really exciting that we can unlock. Um, and it also has me a little scared because as we saw from the Comscore presentation, you know, me measuring that activity and, and being relevant in an environment that's super complex uh, is a challenge. And I think, you know, an example, I, so last night, uh, even though there were the rising star young panel, I was very responsible. I stayed in my room um, <laughs> and I actually, I streamed The Bachelor on my uh, iPad because I hadn't really caught up. Really, dude? The Bachelor? The Bachelor. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, I, you know, it, it, one, one thing that, uh, kind of came across a, from a marketing perspective from that is I was constantly being served over and over uh, a local supermarket chain ad. Uh, and I won't, I won't name the supermarket chain, but you know, it, I think we're at a place where we need to know this is someone streaming something on an iPad in a Hyatt. Um, they're probably not shopping at the local supermarket. And you know, I, th I think we need to be mindful now that people are more mobile, their consumption behavior is uh, evolving, um, that you know, and, and that's a really ex a premium exposure, and they serve, I think they served that to me about a dozen times. Um, that's, that's an expensive, not very, uh, you know, intelligent use of the client's dollar. So it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting environment to be working in, but 
I think it's, you know, it makes it even more exciting uh, for anyone in our position that's just coming into the industry. And, and I'd actually, sorry, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'd ha actually like to add to that. I think that it's important for us to talk about mobility in the certain terms of location. And, and I think we've heard over the last couple of days that we're, we're having trouble catching up with some of the technology um, from an advertising standpoint, that the technology is moving a lot faster than we might be. And I think to John's point that, that the technology is there for us to, to touch base with somebody who is within a mile radius of, of the Hyatt, per se. Do we really need to be talking to them about a supermarket at that point? So we, we as advertisers and agencies and, and this group here needs to make sure that we are utilizing the location-based um, advertising and, and, and different technologies and, and research, of course, to make sure we are pinpointing in the right way and, and being efficient. So I think, um, great point, and I think um, this is kind of a, a difficult thing for me to choose, right? So Solomo excites me because it's exactly what we've been waiting for. I mean, this is, this is the next big thing. I'm sure we'll hear it tossed around for the next conference. Um, but it also scares me. I mean, look at how many of you are on your cell phones right now, right? How many of you have been on your tablets throughout the entire conference? It's, it's, it's exciting because you've, it's, it's exactly what it is, mobile. Um, but it's very hard to catch people's attention now. You know, people have, people don't have 30 seconds to watch a pre-roll ad, but they always have 30 minutes to hear a good story. So the challenge for us is bringing that story not only into an ad unit, but into a place where people are on the go, people are constantly doing things, seeing new things. Um, so. I think Solomo is great. I just think we need to be very cognizant um, that it means something different for us than all of you. And especially, I mean, if we're talking about lower positions, guys, think about the poor junior planners. When they hear Solomo, they think, oh my gosh, more tagging, more trafficking tags, more invoices, more <laughs> billing to do. You know, so I think it's great that we're having these conversations, but we need to help them understand what they're doing. You know, a lot of their tasks, monkeys or machines can do. We need to bring them into these conversations so that they actually have a stake, they have a claim in what we're saying. And I think that it's funny because I was about to just jump in and say that I'm going to talk about neither of those things <laughs> uh, because we swore that we would come up here and say the thing that nobody had heard over yeah. the past two and a half days. And I think that that like, segues right into that point about, um, you know, we talk about a lot of things and we talk about um, you know, Solomo and all these different things. And, and, and I think that we need to start focusing on, and this was, was our, when we said, what would be our ask of you guys? Um, and in, in future conferences moving forward is to, um, is to attach like actionable next steps to everything that we're talking about and understand that like it doesn't just affect the 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 C level or the top level conversation. So when we're talking about and exactly what Jenny said, and this applies for not just digital, this applies for TV and for planning and everything else, is that the minute that we introduce a new technology, the minute that I was a national broadcast buyer for five and a half years, and when Rent Track came about, I was so excited. Um, and I sat with with Bruce in Portland, and I remember thinking how amazing this was that now as a TV buyer, where there hasn't been a ton of innovation, there was going to be a hundred new networks that we could look at. And then I got back to the office and I thought that there my team is going to kill me, that there are 100 new networks now that they have to make Excel charts for and traffic, you know, yeah. send traffic to the networks. And, um, and so I think that one key thing that we've talked a lot about is, like, is automation. Automation is a huge thing, and we need to stop worrying about investing and worrying about all the technology that's, that's happening outside of our industry and start investing more in the technology within our industry. And it's going to take, um, it's going to take a big investment, and it's going to take, um, you know, we were, we were speaking with Bill about it last night about the amount of investment and time that's going to have to happen in the near future to course correct the industry, and that's both in terms of technology to automate, to free up junior level, you know, mm -hmm. folks' time, as well as maybe investment in salaries to raise that, you know, that entry level salary that so we can start getting some people in here that are, that are competitive. You know, we can start getting in some of the Ivy Leagues or competing with, with Silicon Valley um, for talent. And so I think if I can send it on that trajectory for everyone to start saying the things that we've been talking about the, next, yeah. the past few days. Yeah. I because I think as, as we talk more about the future, so this industry is depending on the new generations that are coming after us. We do need to empower them. They can be all about sitting in front of a computer like a monkey just typing and typing away. That's not why we're here. That's not why we're so passionate about what we do. Is we need, so we need to find a way to automate those things. So they need to get done. We all know that. But how do we really find that perfect mix where they're able to kind of step outside of that day to day and really get empowered by all the amazing things that are, are that do happen in the in the industry. So I think we just need to do a better job at empowering and at taking it beyond this. So we all have charged ourselves to make sure that we are bringing it back to our agencies, that we are bringing it back to every single junior person at our company, so they are starting to see beyond and really what the opportunity is. And I, I think. I, we, I, sorry, go <laughs> ahead. Just going right off of that is, you know, I think. 
you made a great point, Jenny, in a bold statement, which is at the core, all of our agencies do, you know, they have the same end goal of helping our brands to succeed. But every agency culture is different. So the execution of these ideas are going to be vastly different across each of our agencies. But what we've talked about as a group is let's walk away with a cohesive, like three actionable items that we think we can start to change at home in our own agencies. You know, we're all from the same city too, so New York is gonna change from these seven people. Um, and <laughs> all right, Trevor, Trevor, last point on this? Yeah, I, I think it's also like, and I think we're all getting this, I think the solution is the process and the people. So the process, um, and the, the seven of us have talked about this, is there's this culture right now of an RFP where we, we give you a brand brief in two pages and we send it out to the media partners that we have and we give you 48 hours to respond with ideas. It's, it's ludicrous. So I think from a, a way that we're starting to engage people, it needs to be more about sitting down, starting with ideas and actually taking the time to develop those. It's not about going out to 25 properties and then seeing what do they bring back, but it's really about leaning forward and engaging with the partners we're working with. And then on the other side is the people, and I, I think we're all, like from John's, like this driven from entrepreneurship point, um, we have to look at the type of people we're bringing in, too. I mean, I, this is like half the, the team that I work with rides skateboards to work. So there's something about like, and we're, we're pulling people from um, fashion houses, and we have a mathematician. So I think we're going to market trying to find people that aren't from media. We feel like we can teach them media and teach them to get smart in those areas, but we want their insights from other angles. And I think as a group, that's where we should start to, to look for the talent pool. We want to be fighting for people who want to work at startups, people who want to start their own business. Um, that's what we want. You know, I, I make one. For sure. sure. I, I think, uh, you know, you, you bring up a great point, and I think about the, the name of this conference, the idea effect, um, it has me thinking a lot about sort of the state of the idea um, in our agencies, in our industry, and sort of are we creating an environment that nurtures good ideas into, you know, into full bloom, into fruition, and I, I think about some of the, the structures out there, the cubicle farms. Um, I, I don't, when you think about where that talent, where those people are coming out of fashion houses, they want to be in a place that they feel that their ideas are going to be actualized. Uh, and I don't necessarily know that at the most junior levels of our organization, when, you, when you're at a lonely desktop terminal, um, as a lot of people have noted, that you're, you're not being, when you're doing that, you're not being collaborative. So as you walk around your agencies, and you see people, you know, buried, buried in whatever is going on, buried in their in their email and in, in phone calls, with with uh, you know uh, uh, with their contacts, uh, they're not collaborating with the people around them. So I think we need like a, a KPI is like how are we respecting ideas in our organizations, or how can we enhance the respect for ideas? And I think you can do it in direct ways, but also indirect ways. We talked about automation freeing up time so that more time can be spent up from the desk and, and you know, collaborating with others is a way to respect ideas. I, you know, can uh, I? So let me okay. just move on to one uh, other point. <laughs> you know, you guys are hitting on something which is so important, which is about the investment of technology into your businesses, right? I mean, it has to be very frustrating when you see your peers, if they're working at Facebook or Google, and they have, you know, kind of all these tools, all these technologies, you know, just simple things like Wi-Fi. I mean, how many people actually have Wi-Fi working in the buildings that you're in? I mean, it's just simple things like that, you know, but also part of it is understanding, you know, are your senior leaders really exposed to this technology? And a lot of you have spoken about doing the reverse mentoring, really trying to help them understand, hey, you know, does your CEO tweet? Do they even know what a tweet is? You know, I mean, there's a lot of lip service given to stuff, but you guys are really about action. It's almost like you guys are starting Occupy Media or something. Um, can you talk a little bit about how hashtag. you're doing this with <laughs> hashtag Occupy Media? Yeah. Um, can you talk about how you're doing this reverse mentoring? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, reverse mentoring, I think, is, is absolutely key, and I think we've done a, in, on, my, on my team anyway, we've done a great job of of making sure that that not only the folks at, at my level are, are have a mentor at you know direct director SVP level or whatever, but the folks at the junior levels they definitely um, have some somebody to go to and can learn from. But we can learn so much from the folks that are just coming in from other industries or from from college for that matter. And Trevor brought up the point of bringing people from anywhere and everywhere, you know, we want those mathematicians. We want folks that are coming from a startup industry. Um, and we can learn so much from them. Um, and, and I think ideas can come from anywhere. And, and John had pointed out that this is, this is the idea effect 
um, conference, and we, we have to, to make sure that we are, we're, we're looking at it from that angle, um, because we want to learn uh, different things from the folks that are bringing different ideas and different thought processes um, to the team. Um, so we've actually established on, on our team a um, cross-athlete, uh, cross I guess you could, you could call it, um, kind of forum where we present different ideas, we present um, whatever plan you guys are working on, and it's, it's from the junior level all the way up to the SVP level. Um, and, and then the Walmart team, is, it's a huge group. There's probably about 80 to 100 folks, and when you can get somebody at the, at the, who's just come in from college to present something about, about grocery and, and why grocery is the, the number one um, growth opportunity for the Walmart business, that, that really empowers them, and I think that that is key. Um, and is uh, empowering our talent to, to feel good about what they do every day. And to add, and on, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> to, to add on to that, I think, um, you know, when I started at MEC, I was fresh out of college, needed a job, um, went to MEC, they put me on an account for business process outsourcing, which is about as sexy as it sounds, right? Like, I came out of college and I was like, yeah, like alcohol <laughs> account or fashion, something fun. Um, and I decided, so I worked on that for about a year and a half. I moved on to a new account that was more up my alleys. My passion's traveling, so it was in that in that uh, vicinity. And funnily enough, I had a better, I feel like I had a better, more fruitful experience on that first account that I didn't think I would enjoy rather than the second account. I think we've talked about this a lot this week that there's a huge misconception about brands among planners where the accounts that you think are gonna be the most fun, the most, um, I guess, beneficial, usually end up being the latest nights, um, you know, the worst pay, the, the worst experience. And it's the accounts that, that have the good people on it. So, you know, Lauren, to your point, I think when you give the junior planners, the senior planners, the opportunity to engage with conversations with the clients in presentations, give us a voice. We have a voice, and sometimes we're not able to use it. Um, so you can imagine the, the new thoughts, the new ideas that are coming to us that we haven't been able to share yet. Um, and I think that's where the agencies start to, start to really flourish. And then going back to that, something that we all talked about was accountability. How do we make them accountable? Because the minute that you're doing that, the minute you're putting a junior person in front of a client, the minute you're actually giving them something that they feel they can own, they're all of a sudden accountable and they're going to be, to really put their best foot forward. So I think accountability was something that we really, really felt that it's empowerment and, account and making them accountable for really what their work is and, and being part of the whole industry. Well, and I think if we go back to like the reverse mentoring and, and that idea, and this was something that we've, we've talked about a lot is, um, you know, it can't be, um, and Carolina had mentioned this before, like it can't be checking a box anymore. We can't check a box of multicultural. We can't check a box of millennials. We can't, we can't just say, I think that we've heard a lot of amazing things. My concern is that we, the week before this conference, sat and talked about our biggest concerns among our group of people, and every single thing we talked about is something that you guys are talking about as like, this is how you guys are addressing this, and this is being discussed, and these are big tops of minds, and big data, and content, and all this stuff. And, so there's a, there's a kink in the hose because you guys are talking about it, but no, we're not hearing it. And so I think that um, if, we can just, if we can just unkink the hose and, and, let, the, and let that trickle down and, and, and do it truly in a way where like we listen to what the young people have to say, but really listen. Don't just, it's, I think it's very, um, there's times when it's sometimes done where, where it seems as if it's being done almost like just to say, well, I checked the box of talking to young people. And I think that, that we, have, we have a lot of interesting things to say, I think. Yeah. Hopefully you feel the same way. Um, and I think that if we, can, if we can open up those communication lines where, where you know, the seven of us now know, but there's 700 other people or 7,000 other people that need to now know what's being said here and, and to share that and to collaborate and to truly like, let us be a part of that process. Um, and I think it, it would be a, you know, much more beneficial for our industry as a whole. You know, so with that, I think what you're hearing here is that these people have a voice. And again, just like your consumers, you know, the brand customers that you're trying to help out, they're going to find a way. They are going to crowdsource this, and they're going to take it up amongst themselves. I almost feel like there's a lobby forming here on stage, <laughs> uh, the millennial lobby. But uh, you know, with that being said, I'd love to kind of close with each of you just saying, you know, one thing about you know what type of media or content or device that you could not live without. Um, are you a cord cutter or not? And what is your leadership style summed up in one word? And we'll start with Lauren. Oh shoot. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So number one was what I can't live without, right? Yeah. Um, this goes without saying. My phone. Um, I, I actually lost my phone in Puerto Rico, and 
it was the worst experience ever. And um, I remember I, I called the, I left it like in a, in a van for the, 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 the tourism group that I went with. And I called them up and I was like, please tell me you found this in the, in, in, the, in the seat or something anywhere, anywhere. And he was like, we have it for you, don't worry, we'll send it. And I was like, how long is it gonna take to get there? Like, I need it right now, you know? Um, so it, I was definitely on edge for that week that it took to get up okay. <laughs> to cord, cord cutting? So cord cutting, yes, sorry, I'm going off forever. Um, so cord cutting, I have, I actually just moved to a new apartment and I am not doing cable at all, it's too expensive. Um, we'll see how that goes. And then um, leadership my, style. my leadership style. My leadership style is definitely collaboration. Um, I want to hear every, from everybody and any, any time. Um, open door policy. Great. Yes? Um, I, I like to think of myself as a 60-year-old woman trapped in a 28-year-old's body, so I consume media not like anybody else probably up here does. I would say probably the thing I can't live without is my DVR. Um, I'm not a cord cutter. I, I have a, a, an extensive cable package. Um, you're welcome, Time Warner. And um, I, so I don't know if I'm the best as like the millennial, like look what I consume. Um, uh, and then my leadership style, I would say, is um, coming from a very traditional background um, and now being in a more like forward thinking um, position or kind of you know innovative position. Um, I really try to, to keep myself um, very grounded in, in the roles of the entire account so that um, so that it fosters collaboration, and that's the big word of today. Um, but that, so that I really like, can show everybody that it's not just, I'm not just coming with my ideas, but that I, that I really understand what everyone's kind of dealing with, so that it, it kind of allows people to be a part of the process, but also feel like I'm understanding like, what they're going through. In, in so you mean position. giving people a voice? Giving people a voice, you could say that. <laughs> Jenny? Um, so what device, what, what can I live without? I'd say my Nike Fuel Band right now. Um, I'm training for a triathlon, so I have to keep track of what I'm doing. Um, and I think that's really where mobile's going, right? Like, I'm really excited to try Google Glasses and all the cool stuff. Um, so that's, that's as far as device. Um, cord cutter, I don't watch a lot of TV anyway, so I hate to burst the bubble and just not really watching it. Um, and then in terms of leadership style, um, uh, my one word would be triplet. I'm a triplet, so I've had to grow up on a team, um, and it's, sometimes it's hard to get your voice heard, but I've learned to kind of collaborate um, in that way, so it's been very influential. You know, interesting trend here, I don't know if folks in the room are hearing this, but not a lot of TV, I know that's probably, you know, very scary for a lot of folks that are traditional, I but... watch enough for all of them, so don't <laughs> worry. Don't worry, it's <laughs> totally mine, yeah. There you go. Uh, Monisha? Um, I would say the one thing I can't live without is an app called Scout Mob, which if you're from the city, you need. It's um, a lot of times 50% discounts for restaurants in the city. Um, I'm 25, I like the discount, but it's also sort of, it makes the city a cafeteria. Like you can try different things and if you don't like it, you never go back. If you love it, you go back all the time, which is what I do. Um, it's better than flash sales because you actually do go back. Um, Am I a cord cutter? Yes, absolutely. I work until 11 p.m. There's no way I'm sitting in front of a screen for the rest of my night. I like to go out, hence the scout bomb. Um, my leadership, leadership style? style is vague. I ask a lot of questions. Um, junior people are at different levels. I mean, obviously, your first day in the workforce, I'm not going to ask you, well, what would you do to solve this brand problem? Um, but I do like to ask questions. Well, why do you think we do it that way? What would you do in this situation? Is that the best that you think we can do? Um, how can we make this look better? That kind of stuff. Carolina? OK. Um, first one, what I can't live without, my iPhone. Um, and I think we've all kind of talked about it. But I wake up to it. It is my alarm in the morning. It is my training partner. I'm also training for a triathlon. It really, every single thing that I do kind of goes through my phone. So I couldn't imagine my life without it right so, now. So mobile truly is the first screen. It really is. <laughs> and then that kind of goes to the second question, am I a uh, core cutter or not? A little bit I become, actually. Uh, I've seen that most of my consumption of video is really not done through a second screen. So whether it's on, the, um, on my Kindle Fire, whether it's on my phone, most of it I'm consuming uh, through non-traditional TV. And then my leadership style, I would say inclusive. Um, I like to include my team. I like to make sure that they're coming along for the ride and really making them feel part of it uh, every step of the way. John? I, I like what Monisha did. She said an app, because I, I think uh, it, I'm less attached to what screen it is and more just the service. Um, for, and I'm addicted to Evernote. I don't know how many Evernote users mm -hmm. there are in here. Yeah. 
but uh, I, I use it for literally everything. I take meeting notes in it. I keep a, like a journal of my dreams. I was attacked by a swordfish <laughs> in my dream. <laughs> so, so I don't know if anyone wants to Google that. Is being on The Bachelor um, on it? What did you say? Is being on The Bachelor part of that dream list? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so Evernote, yeah, that, uh, that I would say I'm addicted to that. I'm not a cord cutter. Uh, but as far as my content consumption, I'd, I think you know, li limited uh, amount of time. So I'm selective about what I'm watching. Clearly, the bat you can see <laughs> I have great taste. Awesome. Um, <laughs> But I'm, deep, I'm more deeply engaged with the content I am watching. So if I'm watching the, the Knicks game, I have Twitter up and you know, all, all of my key basketball twi you know, people I'm following on Twitter as I'm watching the game. Or if I'm watching an episode of Homeland, you know, I'll listen to a podcast episode recap. So deeper engagement with less, um, with less content. Uh, and I think describing my leadership style, I said it earlier, I think Lego leadership, just trying to inspire people to feel creative, you know, allowing them to take risks but not letting them fall off a cliff, um, and you know, just inspiring them to try and become you know, as useful as they can, tap into the people around them. And Trevor? Yeah, uh, so up on the technology front, I have two. One's a coffee maker, so it's not really digital technology, but it goes with the second one, which I think is, is, uh, is anything like newsstand related on iPads or platforms, a, a voracious reader, so just trying to access that. Um, cord cutter, which kind of sounds like a bad word as we all say it up there. <laughs> yeah. um, I am. So I, I think people forget that you can still get the broadcast networks for free. Uh, there's HD signals out there, so you can still get football and everything. Um, and then everything else over the set top. Uh, and then from a leadership style, I think it's about um, collaboration. So sitting with your team, rolling up your sleeves, and actually getting into the projects they're working on and leading through that. Well, I, I just want to salute all of you on this panel. It is a privilege to kind of be within this company. You are all future CEOs and future leaders in our industry. So please, round of applause. Thank you.